force majeure, also known as acts of God. Cyclones, floods, earthquakes, storms, volcanoes, and droughts. Then there are man-made calamities, such as wars and their terrible consequences. Desperate Hours examines some of the more noteworthy cataclysmic events of the last 100 years. In this installment, we turn up the heat to examine a natural phenomenon that is both a friend and a foe to humankind. Some two to four thousand years ago, our ancestors had learned how to create and control fire, a step vital to human development. We won't be going back quite that far in this episode, but we do travel back in time to remind ourselves that dangerous and deadly fires are a fact of life, as immutable as the wind, the rain, or the seasons. In Australia, bushfires are an inconvenient fact of life, but now and then they spiral into tragedy on a national scale. The weekend in Australia. It's a time of relaxation that occupies a special place in the Aussie mindset. Off go the work clothes, shorts and flip-flops take their place, screw-top wine bottles are liberated and barbecues are fired up. But for people in the state of Victoria, relaxation and certainly barbecues took a back seat when the Black Saturday bushfires began raging on Saturday, February 7, 2009. seen a movie it's just terrible absolutely terrible couldn't do much really because for safety reasons we just couldn't um, go into the, into the bush too long because we've got to worry about our own safety oh there's heaps of devastation but as far as what's happening now it's quiet indeed the fires began on a day when several places in victoria recorded their highest temperatures in 150 years since 1859 when the keeping of such records began Spoken of today as Australia's worst ever bushfire disaster, the fires resulted in the deaths of some 173 people, with over 400 people injured, many of them seriously. Following the horrific events of February 7, 2009 and its repercussions, the day has become known forever as Black Saturday. The people will cope, uh, we've all had our cries and we'll have that for a long time yet, but to lose friends, to lose friends' children, uh, a lot of people are not going to come back. As with any tragedy of this scale, the ray of hope came from the fact that help and assistance came from across the globe. Pemberian bantuan satu juta dolar bagi upaya rekonstruksi dan rehabilitasi utamanya sekolah-sekolah yang terbakar serta pengiriman satu tim identifikasi korban bencana disaster victims identifications dari Mabes Polri Some of the fires are thought to have been started deliberately Prime Minister Kevin Rudd said if arsonists were to blame it amounted to mass murder and anyone perceived as being in any way responsible was in for close scrutiny. Then, as now, however, no matter how bad things get, if you have to face a disaster, it's probably better to do so from the comparative advantage of a first world economy.
Then again, sometimes it's just a case of being in the wrong place at the wrong time, and no amount of privilege or power can protect you. Case in point, the first years of the millennium and a group of party people out to let their hair down to the sounds of Great White. Ring any musical bells? Well, Great White were a hard rock band with big hair that had a hit with Once Bitten, Twice Shy at the tail end of the 1980s. Still performing more than a decade later, they weren't quite drawing the same capacity crowds as in their heyday. Nonetheless, hundreds of people went to see them one Thursday night in Rhode Island at a place called the Station Nightclub. Pyrotechnics were part of the band's act, but they had barely begun their set when stage props went up in flames. Fire alarms went off and over 400 people rushed towards the front exit. It was just like a stampede of people. So. Everybody just tried to get out, and they were jumping out the windows and, and out the front door. There were people on fire, and I've got a few friends that we still haven't accounted for yet. Um, it's just a lot of chaos, really. People were hurt and killed. In the rush to flee, the concert goers had panicked, and the narrow hallway that led to the exit became a death trap. The station nightclub burned to the ground, in the space of six minutes. 100 people died and 230 were injured, with only 132 making it out unscathed. And it went up so quick, I've never seen anything like it. I'm, I'm, I just hope to God nobody got hurt. I mean, I know people got hurt, I just hope nobody got killed because this is too much to you know? There were no sprinklers. He's the only person who has taken any responsibility in this case. If this isn't the case that deserves a serious sentence of misdemeanor manslaughter, what one is? Following the fire, both the club owner and the band manager, 29-year-old Daniel Bichel, seen here in court, were charged with 100 counts of criminal negligence and manslaughter. This court will therefore sentence you to 15 years at the ACI four years of which to be served by you, with 11 years suspended. This singular tragedy did much to influence fire safety codes in the United States. The club had no sprinkler system, something which could have saved many lives. This was scarcely the first or last time when a little prevention would have been better than any cure or rescue effort. What exactly is fire? Well, fire is most usually the visible result of a chemical reaction between oxygen and fuel of some kind. Gasoline or wood are two examples. Now, wood and gasoline don't just catch fire all by themselves simply because they happen to be surrounded by oxygen in the atmosphere. For fire to occur, the fuel has to be heated until it reaches its ignition temperature. But whatever it is, be it lightning striking a tree or a match lighting the end of a cigar, if sufficient heat is applied to a flammable surface, 
then combustion occurs, and there you have it, fire. Of course, fire has many uses, but when it gets out of control, the consequences can be dreadful. Some of the most common causes of household and workplace fires are arson, but there are many other causes, like children literally playing with fire, electrical or lighting equipment that is faulty or misused, fireworks celebrations that go terribly wrong, candles burning down and setting furniture and fabrics ablaze, household appliances that malfunction, such as air conditioning units and washing machines, and commonly, cigarettes left smoldering in ashtrays. Much of the equipment we think of as standard for fighting fires was invented long ago. For example, the fire hose, made of flexible leather and coupled every 50 feet with brass fittings, first appeared in the 17th century. Yet it remains the standard even to this day in mainland Europe. The one thing that has never changed, of course, is the sense of duty, of valor. However sophisticated the equipment becomes, a firefighter is still expected to go rushing into a burning building as everyone else goes rushing out. Firefighters, whether male or female, and the vast majority are still men, are all required to pull heavy lengths of hose, to scale stairs while carrying giant power tools, and lift 35-foot long wooden ladders. All firefighters around the globe would agree on the importance of safety regulations in building codes and in the workplace, as well as fire safety awareness amongst the general public. The job of a firefighter is already tough enough, without carelessness and ignorance making it even more difficult. At least a thousand shoppers were inside the store when the fire began to rampage through the third floor. The store had been holding an American week. One theory is that the fire was started by anti-American demonstrators protesting against American policy in Vietnam. Even after all these years, over 300 people incinerated at once around lunchtime on a shopping day still seems an absolutely shocking loss of life. To this day, it is not clear where the fire began. In the furniture department on the fourth floor, the first floor children's wear department, or with exploding butane canisters in the third floor camping department. Witness accounts vary. In any case, because no fire alarms went off, and nor were there any sprinklers, the alarm was slow to be raised. With just a small number of handheld fire extinguishers available, and the difficulty for firefighters of tackling an inferno in the midst of a maze of crowded streets, the fire spread quickly. How or rather who started the fire is still a matter of conjecture. A so-called American week at the department store had instigated anti-Vietnam war protests, peaceful ones, it should be noted. But then a survivor claimed to have heard someone shout, I'm giving my life for Vietnam just as the fire broke out. If anyone really knows the truth, they've kept it quiet for a long time. Restored, refurbished, and brimming with opportunities for retail therapy for today's Brussels Boulevard here, the tragedy that took place here now seems a distant memory. As we saw earlier in the case of the station nightclub blaze, playing with pyrotechnics is one thing. Making mistakes with weapons-grade explosives, that's the next level. But that's exactly what happened in Lagos, Nigeria, on a fateful day in January 2002.
the accidental detonation of a large stock of high explosives at a military storage facility in Nigeria's second city had terrible consequences for the civilian population. Fires created by the debris scattered from this explosion tore through a large section of northern Lagos, creating a wave of panic that spread fast. As people fled, many stumbled into a concealed canal and were drowned. I give you up. Francis, for up. No. Heard about the bomb from this barrack here. So, the first thing that you just saw, you had the sand. Bah! People were just rushing to the place, not until a bigger explosion. You just suddenly your phone, boom, and everybody just started running. Our family are nowhere to be found. We don't have house to lay our heads, we don't have food to eat. And then a very useless. The explosion and its consequences are believed to have killed at least 1,100 people, with many thousands more either injured or left homeless. They died an untimely death, innocently, and they deserve to be buried decently. I can see the most of my life is in ruins. I don't even know where to start from. I mean, you have to go in there to see the extent of destruction. There's nothing that can be taken out of this place. It's so terrible, my dear brother. The Nigerian government held an official inquiry, which blamed the army for neither maintaining the base properly or in fact decommissioning it as directed to do the previous year. History and tragedy almost repeated themselves in Lagos a dozen years later when there was a fire at the main police armory in July 2014. Fortunately, there were no casualties this time. On the 12th of August, 2015, the entire world was shocked by the news and dramatic footage coming out of Chanjin in northern China. That's when two enormous explosions in the northern port city killed dozens of people, injured hundreds more, and laid waste to large parts of the city, igniting fires that would take firefighters several days to subdue. Like a nuclear explosion was a phrase that would be repeated again and again both by news agencies and from eyewitness accounts. Satellite photos released by the Japan Meteorological Agency revealed that the explosions were so large they were visible from space. The two massive blasts occurred in the warehouse district of Tianjin. One of the blasts was said to be the equivalent of 21 tons of TNT. We 
们看到失火了，看到着火了，我们全人都爆炸，知道这吧？有大概我们同时有四个人受伤了，我们一起干活的十几个，有四个四个人就受伤了，啊，有的是比较严重，有的是轻伤。Official Chinese media sources claim that the initial blasts took place at a petrol station in the so-named Binhai New Development Zone. There were also claims that the explosions took place at the port city's cargo terminal. For police and firefighters, the initial response was on search and rescue operations, more than putting out the fire, to allow all the chemicals to burn themselves out. This being the age of social media, Many people captured jaw-dropping photos and videos of the blaze. As firefighters did their best to battle the smaller fires that broke out around the site, toxic smells were discernible in the air. Chinese authorities were quick to reassure nervous citizens that the air had not been contaminated by the blasts and fires. But there was concern, to put it mildly, that some residences were situated too close to the industrial plant. According to Chinese work safety regulations, chemical warehouses containing potentially hazardous materials are meant to be at least 1,000 meters away from public buildings, roads, and so on. The chemistry explosion ruined the whole area around one kilometer. It was eventually confirmed that there had been several hundred tons of the toxic chemical sodium cyanide on the site at the time of the blasts but the authorities insisted safety regulations had been strictly adhered to. In any case, it took nearly a week before the raging infernos caused by the explosions were under control. By this time, official figures put the death toll at at least 114 people, with dozens still missing. This grim statistic included 64 firefighters and six policemen, the usual frontline casualties in any battle against a disaster of this kind. Unlike earthquakes, tsunamis, and volcanoes, fires are something that is within our capacity to prevent, at least for much of the time. There's also wisdom in the old Boy Scout motto, be prepared. For you never know when desperate hours may be ahead.
extraordinary events causing great loss of life, damage, or hardship, like a flood, a tornado, an airplane crash, or an earthquake. Awesome reminders of the terrible power of nature and grim lessons in mankind's capacity for destruction. In desperate hours, you'll be an eyewitness to some of the greatest disasters of the last 100 years. In this episode, we contemplate from a safe distance the lethal majesty of volcanoes, one of the planet's most destructive as well as spectacular natural forces. It is estimated there are up to 4,000 volcanoes on Earth, of which annually about 50 are active volcanoes above sea level, emitting in their eruptions millions of tons of dust, ash, and gases, and endangering the lives and property of millions of people. Montserrat, an emerald island in the Caribbean Sea, described by tourist guidebooks as late as the 1990s as a tropical paradise. The beauty of Montserrat must have enchanted voyagers already in 1493, when it was discovered by Christopher Columbus. It was the volcano that changed the tropical paradise into hell on Earth. although geologists believed that the Sufria Hills volcano was inactive. On 18 July 1995, after four quiet centuries, this sleeping giant suddenly awoke. The subsequent huge eruption spewed out large volumes of pyroclastic material over a radius of 15 kilometers. The following apocalypse especially hit the capital city of Plymouth, which will never forget this day. Plymouth was buried in several meters of mud and ash. The day changed into night. The quiet atmosphere of a town carelessly bathing in the sun just a while beforehand suddenly changed into the worst nightmare. Look up, and what I saw when I left the cabin running, I ran away from the mountain coming down. The point on which I decide to leave the island is after I've been, been over in the hills and see the last Pyroclastic flow that make me move. Two thirds of the population had to be evacuated, hastily leaving their homes, which most of them never returned to. I was living in the buffer zone, right? The, um, the zone which they would move next if activity from the volcano increases and right now they have evacuated that zone. Pero ahora yo no sé qué van a hacer ahora porque evacuaron desde yo vivía, mi mamá vivía en el parte en el norte donde no evacuaron todavía. Because of the volcano, the number of Montserrat inhabitants fell from 12,000 to 4,500 people. However, none of the people who refused to leave their beloved Caribbean island knew that the fury of the volcano was not over. Almost two years later, on 15 June 1997, a new explosion shook the volcano with a subsequent outburst of magma. Flows of lava literally ate into the hill on its way. And again, a massive mud flow covered the capital Plymouth and surrounding villages. 
frightened people watched as lava flowing down the volcano slopes flattened villages and burned houses. On that day, Sufria Hills claimed 19 lives, burning them alive in hot lava. At the time of the disaster, the victims were in the forbidden area where they had fields and homes which they refused to leave. They took the risk and were unlucky, which cost them their lives. Further eruptions reinforced the flows of hot lava, which gradually buried the lively town of Plymouth on the shore. The formerly vibrant and easygoing town now witnessed apocalyptic scenes of destroyed streets covered in endless gray. Although volcanic eruptions still occasionally occur, the inhabitants of the island hope that the worst is over. Iceland is known as the land of ice and fire. The icy white landscape evokes a sense of purity and innocence. As if from time to time, it had to be stained with ash coming from volcanic eruptions. In the territory of Iceland, there are 30 active volcanic systems. Iceland is located at the top of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge where two different tectonic plates meet. This contributes to the very intense volcanic and seismic activity in Iceland, which is not to be found anywhere else on Earth. The eruption of 1973, which took place on Hime Island, is believed to be one of the world's worst natural disasters of the 20th century. On 21 January 1973, around 8 p.m., the island was shaken by several small, almost imperceptible shocks. Despite this, nobody expected a catastrophe, the extent of which was to come. Does this volcano come as a complete surprise to you, or did you have any warning? There was no warning whatsoever until 10 o'clock yesterday evening. Uh, which the... was the earthquake? Yeah. Yes. Uh, how much danger do you think this uh, eruption represents to the country, the island and its livelihood? It's quite difficult to say. It uh, depends on the volume of lava produced and on wind direction. So there's a possibility that it won't be very dangerous? It's quite, yes, I, I think so, actually. At 2 a.m. on 23 January 1973, a new crack appeared in the eastern side of the volcano Eldfell, whose name means Mountain of Fire in Icelandic. It was less than a kilometer away from the center of Hime City, whose citizens were caught absolutely unprepared. Red-hot lava started to flow from the crack at appalling speed. Volcanic dust fell on the roofs of houses. 
the frightened citizens of the island were woken by police sirens and evacuated to safety off the island. They were lucky. They were all successfully evacuated in time. As there had been a strong storm around the island the previous day, most of the fishing boats had stayed in the harbor. They were used to save lives. Older and helpless people were transported by air, others on the boats. They watched as streams of lava flowed through the streets of their town destroying their houses and property, ruining their lives. The catastrophe changed the lives of all 5,000 inhabitants of the island forever. Many have never returned for fear of further eruptions, and others have had to start life again from scratch. Recently, we were again reminded of the power and presence of Icelandic volcanoes. The volcanic eruption of Eyjafjallajökull in 2010 resulted in a vast volcanic ash cloud, which blocked air travel throughout Europe. Today, most of the UK remains covered by the ash cloud. Eruption uh, it may stop tomorrow, but it may continue to disrupt air traffic for weeks or months. We don't know anything. We don't know how to go home. We don't know how to get any information uh, about what to do. And we don't have anywhere to stay. The explosive activity might drop down for a period of time, but then we will have uh, over a, maybe an extensive period of time, months to even years, uh, intermittent explosive eruptions. Iberia put us up for a few nights and gave us food put us on today's flight, today's flight's cancelled, and now they say they're not going to give us any more accommodation or any food. It was not a strong eruption, but according to seismologists, another eruption of similar scope is just a matter of time. Volcanic eruptions have always fascinated and terrified people. These natural giant fireworks emit streams of bubbling, boiling lava, traveling at speeds of up to 165 meters per second. As the lava spreads out in a breathtaking show, it can cause destruction, death, and doom. This flaming, bubbling hell turns into vast streams, a lethal mixture of volcanic ash solid lava, mud, and water, which sweeps down the mountain slopes like an unstoppable river. How and where are volcanoes born? They begin life at a depth of between 80 to 220 kilometers below the Earth's surface, in a place known as the asthenosphere. The asthenosphere is actually a viscous mantle of the Earth, which allows for the movement of the Earth's lithospheric plates. Without the asthenosphere, the plates would not be able to move, and the renewal of the Earth's crust would not be possible. Where the plates touch each other, slide past one another, move under or over one another. This is where the Earth's crust is so broken that magma can find its way up to the surface. This is how a volcanic crater develops.
Indonesia has been seen as symbolic of volcanic disasters ever since the eruption of the legendary Krakatoa volcano in 1883. This land, like Iceland, is referred to as the land of volcanoes and lies in the Sunda Strait, where there is frequent Strombolian activity. Every now and then, some of them erupt, causing a local disaster. The same applies to Merapi Volcano, literally meaning Fire Mountain in the local language, is arguably Indonesia's most dangerous volcano with a history of deadly eruptions. The volcano is frequently active with eruptive episodes occurring every few years, posing a threat to more than one million people living on the slopes of the volcano. This type of activity has occurred frequently in past years, usually lasting for a few weeks or months each time. On 26 October 2010, Merapi violently erupted, spewing flows of hot rock and gas kilometers away from the summit and devastating the surrounding area. The huge explosion caused a collapse of its lava dome and red hot clouds of ash rolled down the slopes of the mountains, burning everything that stood in their way. They devastated tens of villages and all the fertile fields on the slopes. Further explosions continued daily for approximately two weeks before activity started to decrease in the middle of November. Like in 94, it was the dome collapse and the seismicity and also in the deformation, there was no signal. At the peak of activity on November 5, pyroclastic flows traveled 16 kilometers from the summit, destroying everything in their path. During the 2010 eruptive episode, more than 300 people were killed, making this most recent eruption the greatest volcanic disaster at Merapi in 80 years. Over 300,000 people were evacuated from their homes within a 20 kilometer radius of the volcano and moved to temporary shelters in safer areas away from the fiery reaches of the volcano. Saya ke sini karena kena abu dari Merapi itu. Lantas saya menjadi sesak nafas dan pusing. Ya dari apa? Dampak gua mau ngomong Merapi ini ada debu. Terus ya ada riwayat tekanan darah tinggi juga ya. Pengembalian psikisnya yang sekali menjaga. Takutnya ada yang trauma, yang ngedrop. Sakit kita di sini anak-anak sama manula. Thanks to the detailed geological monitoring and timely warnings by the Indonesian Center of Volcanology and the resulting rapid evacuations, it is estimated that 10 to 20,000 lives were saved. All time, that Merapi gives two different, two different uh, activity. One eruption, explosion, and one storm collapse. Both are dangerous. So what does the future hold for Merapi and the people living on its hazardous slopes?
scientists face a challenge to unravel the driving forces behind Merapi's activity. Past eruptions hold the key to future eruptive styles, so unlocking the secrets of what lies behind Merapi's activity will help volcanologists to prevent further catastrophes occurring. The devastating explosions accompanying volcanic eruptions can completely destroy prosperous ecosystems and whole civilizations. One such volcano is Mount Yirangongo, elevation 3,470 meters in war-torn Congo, whose last eruption occurred in January 2002. In that eruption, Lava appeared on the surface directly at the edge of Goma City in Minigi, where it started to flow out of the earth and cut the city in two. Many people had no place to flee and suffocated. Lava streams got as far as Lake Kivu, The number of victims reached about a hundred. Thousands of people lost their homes. Everything, they've lost everything, even for those houses of which they're still standing, but they've, they've lost the roof, the rooftops, and they've lost their, they've lost their belongings. Yes, they've lost everything. My house is still down. Now I don't know what I can do. Now I don't know why my family was going. Now I try to see some way if I can find to him. Niragongo is one of the most active volcanoes on Earth. It is unique for its lava crater lake and highly liquid lava which you cannot escape from. Experts warn that if Niragongo shows its true power, Goma City, with its one million inhabitants, will become a contemporary Pompeii. Another threat with potentially inconceivable consequences is Yellowstone National Park in the USA. The National Park is located on a supervolcano. Yellowstone is the supervolcano's caldera, under which there is the largest magma chamber in the world. It's never possible to predict a volcano, to say the volcano will erupt in three years or in 25 years. We cannot tell the future. We can only monitor the present. Queste aree eh, possono dare origine come massime eruzioni alle uniche eruzioni che possono avere effetti catastrofici globali, al pari di grandi impatti meteoritici. According to scientists, the likelihood of the supervolcano erupting is five to ten times higher than the likelihood of Earth being hit by an asteroid. We can only hope that neither we nor our descendants will experience the eruption of the supervolcano, which would bring death to hundreds of thousands of people and horrible consequences to cope with for millions of people, not only in America, but worldwide. These are volcanoes, time bombs, where it is actually just a question of time before an eruption of devastating extent will occur. And what's more, we know well that man cannot fight against nature, but must learn to live with it.